the lower 10% of families on the socioeconomic scale. Wow. You know, I, I remember when... Uh, His name was different from themselves from our society through sterilization. And this sort of very slowly slipped in uh, as being something that was projected to the American public as being positive. You know, we want you to be better, we want you to be stronger and fitter, but at the same time, there was that insidious end that who were on society that wanted to, to uh, eliminate the blind. And not only those who were blind did they want to stop from reproducing, but also all of their siblings and all of their family members. Somehow the idea was if we uh, sterilize all of these people, we will never have anyone who is blind again. It was that sort of thing. They did it with uh, epileptics. They did it with anyone who had perceived defects, um, whether they were mental or physical. Um, well, we, so, we, we uh, you know, one of the things that we hear comments on all the time, we hear that, you know. Uh, they were traveling around the country. They had uh, social workers who were working on this as well, and they were making family tree charts. And in these charts, uh, they would have uh, the mother and the father, and they would list all of the de- defects or perceived defects that these people had. Let's say the father was an alcoholic. That was a defect uh, and reason for possible sterilization. And then they would show how alcoholism was passed down through the family. And all of these people were considered defective, so, uh, you know, of course we needed to sterilize them, and if we had that entire family sterilized, then uh, we would no longer have alcoholism in our society. Uh, we should just do that with politicians. <laughs> and they did this to several different groups. Uh, they did it, they declared some people feeble-minded, and there was really no de- definition for being feeble-minded, Um uh, there now, was a, a now, woman, for example. <laughs> I was going to say, now we just elect him to office. And her father had died, and the mother was left alone raising four children. Well, she was supporting herself through prostitution, and she was a drag on the society in Virginia. So her children were taken from her. She was declared feeble-minded. And she was placed in uh, the Virginia State College, Colony for Epileptics and the Feeble-Minded in Lynchburg, Virginia. And her daughter ended up being sterilized after she gave birth to a child out of wedlock. In the wow. end, we found out that that daughter was of normal uh, intellectual capacity and had actually been raped by her foster parents nephew my goodness but he was also placed in the Virginia colony uh, state colony for the epileptics and feeble-minded and sterilized and her young daughter was placed with those foster uh, the foster family who had raised her so it was a very difficult situation well, it probably I, I, sounds like Hitler to some people listening, the master race, the super race. And what particularly bothered me, uh, all my grandparents came from Eastern Europe. And these guys were giving uh, intelligence tests in English to people who came in who couldn't speak English and saying, see, they're feeble-minded. Can't I, pass a simple test. I was just going to ask, <laughs> how, how does immigration affect the idea of eugenics? Well, you don't want those immigrants. They're obviously unsuitable, uh, inferior, uh, to be kept out. Uh, You know, a lot of Nobel Prize winners come out of that group of people. (laughs) I reckon so. A lot of great baseball players, too. You know, I remember when C.W. Post and Dr. Kellogg. European Jews. 
southern Italians. And so they immediately wanted to give IQ tests to these people and, of course, administered in English with questions pertaining to the locations of the five top universities in the United States or the colors of certain gemstones, you know, uh, really a great test of one's intelligence. And uh, it was used as a way to attempt to prevent immigrants from coming into this country. It was a clearly discrimination. Right, right. But, you know, that, that happens inside our country, too. You know, and, and there are efforts to fight that. I remember when C.W. Post and Dr. Kellogg were trying to find a way to make a more fit human being. Now, C.W. Post was kind of a, a health food proponent, and he came up with all kinds of cereals and breads that we still use today. I mean, who could forget Tony the Tiger, you know, with Kellogg's? So do we still have yeah. the effects of eugenics in our society today, as cosmopolitan as we are? Well, there's certainly a lot of public attitudes that indicate certain groups of people are obviously inferior. Uh, you know, Hitler, fortunately, in some ways, Hitler carried it to an extreme, and that put uh, a break on the eugenics movement in the United States. Uh, I'm not saying Hitler was good. I'm just saying that because of his excesses, uh, you know, talking about the master race and stuff, uh, finally some Americans woke up. But as is pointed out in the book, some of the people who supported this kind of stuff were rich people. Yeah, uh, sure, exactly. Yeah. Wealthy people are definitely not feeble-minded because obviously they've been blessed by God, the old Calvinist uh, doctrine. <laughs> uh, Absolutely, and and some of that money from some of the wealthiest families in the United States went to fund Joseph Mengele's experiments in Germany, and um, the University of Heidelberg awarded an honorary doctorate to one of the two leaders of of the American eugenics movement. When the Germans uh, were becoming more and more successful at eugenics, perceived by the eugenics movement in the United States, they were the United States uh, organization was lamenting the fact that the Germans were beating them at their own game. Well, you know what's interesting in the, on the legal side of things. Uh, there was a woman who led the fight for a long time and ended up on the U.S. Supreme Court. Her name, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a mm -hmm. big proponent of eugenics. Uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's a big one. Uh, Something. Interesting. Uh, in any of the research that I had done. Hmm. Me neither. Well. If you uh, if you follow the uh, the documentation that is held by the Right to Life group, and you follow Ruth Bader Ginsburg back about forty years, you will see that that is what she was involved in. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. L little little known facts uh, once people get uh, elevated to that level. Uh, let's bring a little more current. You know, we've had a real flap of late on the idea of global warming. It's one of the recent fables that we have. The real question is, which one is the fable? Are humans impacting the Earth or not? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, there, there are two separate questions here. Is the world warming or cooling or doing anything else? And whatever it's doing, is man responsible for it? And the biggest, of course, is that small group of very noisy people who think that CO2 is the biggest evil in man's history. If we can only reduce the amount of evil CO2 we produce, then everything will be okay. The world won't, you know, the glaciers won't melt. Uh, everything will be fine. The trouble is... What I found is that, uh, again, we have noisy negativists, uh, and some of it's been exposed, 
in, in the past year, there's been a, a, a major effort on the part of some of the news media to dig into things like Climate Gate, all those emails out in England and Anglia, East Anglia University, where basically they were saying, hey, we got to watch what we let get published. We can't have any disagreement. We have a party line here that all scientists agree that evil CO2 needs to be defeated, and we need to spread money, billions, hundreds of billions of dollars, from the rich countries, which are the ones producing all that bad CO2, to the poor countries. It's not their fault, uh, it says here in small print. And so... uh, (laughs) Exactly. There has been a growing recognition that that's a gross simplification. It's kind of like the talk about conundrums. Uh, The people who are anti nuclear uh, don't want to build nuclear power plants, even though they're pro, uh, you know, do something about global warming. We have to reduce the amount of CO2. And the best way to do that, of course, in a power plant is nuclear which doesn't produce any CO2. So there's a dichotomy there that I don't know how they live with themselves. <laughs> we want to reduce CO2, but we don't want any of those nuclear power plants, boy. And fortunately, uh, in several European countries, or within just the, this past year, there has been a strong movement to get rid of the rules that they had temporarily passed to shut down all the nuclear power plants, to offer huge subsidies for the development of the building, fabrication, erection of uh, solar power plants, windmills, and so forth. People were winding up paying huge, much more money for their power than with normal uh, fossil fuel systems. Sure. And the countries found that, hey, who can afford this? Wait a minute, what are we doing here? Well, you I mean, know, we're there, giving a lot of money. There's no doubt that we have scientific armies lining up on both sides. I mean, you have people that that say, are you crazy? Of course the earth is warming. And yet we have others that say, now, wait a minute, glaciers have been growing steadily for the last seven or eight years. We really haven't seen any temperature rise in over 11 years. So what are you griping about? And the worry is that you've got the Al Gores of the world who have made a tremendous political football out of this and managed to move literally billions of dollars around to enrich their friends who are involved in, of course, green technologies. Um, so the, the big, what does the public do? What do they believe? Which is the scientific folly? You have credible scientists on both sides pointing fingers at each other, some saying it's absolute nonsense, others saying, uh, hey, it's uh, been uh, over 90 degrees now for 21 days in a row on the East Coast. Who says the world's not warming? It's like they yeah, use... the question is, who, whose fault is it that it's warming? And also, uh, people don't seem to realize uh, CO2 is not the largest greenhouse gas. It's water vapor. But that's a lot harder to predict. And you can't blame it on anybody. You know, we make CO2 in our power plants and with our vehicles and so forth. But water vapor is all over the place. And well, also, we, we go back and get the historical you know that, information from ice and from tree rings. What do the tree rings tell us? Well, the, one of the most interesting uh, tests, if you will, experiments that I found was uh, in Scotland, where they dendrochronology. Uh, they cut a bunch of trees that had all been planted at the same time, and they uh, froze the uh, the pieces and. They monitored the growth as you move across the ring, you know, years, hot, cold, whatever. And uh, what they found, surprisingly, was that what determined the the best correlation they had with the growth of the tree rings had to do with the solar cycles and, more importantly, in that case, with the uh, cosmic rays, particles from out there. And... You know, in the news broadcast at the beginning of the show, they talked about this big solar storm up on the sun and the importance of the magnetic fields and all that. Well, you go back 50 years, magnetic fields have no place in what goes on in the sun. It's all gravitational, and we have this solar constant 
which isn't constant as it turns out. Uh, the sun is always putting out the same 